Okay, we'll call this council meeting to order at 6 p.m. Need a motion for adoption of the minutes. Resolved that the minutes of the regular meeting of council held at City Hall on Monday, April 25th, 2016 be adopted as circulated. Moved by Councillor Buds, seconded by Councillor Draycott. <coughs> All those in favor? And that's carried. We have uh, no delegations this evening, so we'll move right into hearings. Uh, we'll open the uh, public hearing for rezoning bylaw 16-8643, 709, 716, 718, 720, 722, and 724 will obey. Is there anyone here to speak to the hearing? Chair Ferris, I'm here if you have any questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you. So just as a reminder, if we close the hearing, then uh, there'll be no opportunity for the public to comment on that, and this will be up to council at that point. So a final reminder, if there's any anyone to speak to that. Hearing none. Resolved that the public hearing for rezoning bylaw 16-8643, 709, 716, 718, 720, 722, 724 will obey now be closed. Um, Council is familiar with this as we already gave this uh, this first reading, so I'm not going to go through the complete detail of this motion. But as we know, there's the request to uh, to change some of the zoning. Uh, this application was circulated with all city departments, and as mentioned previously, there was the note that um, there was some concerns expressed regarding one existing single-family dwelling or residence between two R3 residential multiple uh, family zones if approved. But I think um, that if there was some concerns besides city department that would have been addressed to residents in the area. And as, as of the writing, uh, council had not, or administration had not received any written objections to the proposed rezoning scheme. So at least from my perspective, um, filling in for Councillor Dreger, I'm confident uh, with the recommendation to move forward. So with that in mind, it is a recommendation of Council of the City of Portage Prairie to approve the application to rezone the land known as 709, 716, 718, 720, 722, 724, Willow Bay, and legally described as Lot 5, Block 4, <coughs> Plan 1741, Lots 41 through 45, Block 1, Plan 1741, Parish of Portage Prairie, from R1, Residential Single Family Zone, to R3 residential multiple family zone and that bylaw 16-8643 be read a second time. Moved by Councillor Bud, seconded by Councillor Fraze. Any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And finally that bylaw number 16-8643 be read a third time, finally passed, signed and sealed. Moved by Councillor Bud, and seconded by Councillor Fraze. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. Uh, Councilor Preece. We'll open the public hearing for variation PC 15-16. This is for Jim and Catherine Ogilvy. Is there anyone here to speak to the hearing? Uh, just that we're here to answer questions if uh, anybody has them. Okay, thank you. Jim Ogilvy. All right, I'm um, seeing that there is no one to speak to it other than uh, Mr. Ogilvie. Uh, be it resolved that the public hearing for a variation PC 15-16, Jim and Catherine Ogilvie now be closed. Moved by Councillor Buds, seconded by Councillor Draycott. All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, so I know Council has reviewed this application as highlighted there, the front yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 5.49 meters and the rear yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 3.66 meters. And there is a sketch that is provided. I know Council has reviewed it. The building is in a R1 residential single family zone. Um, as per uh, common occurrence, the application has been circulated to the various city departments with no concerns being expressed and public notices have been sent to all properties owners within 100 meter radius. So it is a recommendation of this committee and I so move that the Council of the City of Portage Prairie approve the variation request of Jim and Catherine Ogilvy to vary the front yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 5.49 meters and the rear yard requirements of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 3.66 meters at the property known as 104 4th Street Southwest, which is legally described as Lot 1, Plan 880, Parish of Portra Prairie. Moved by Councillor Buds, 
Second by Councillor Fraze. Any questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Fraze? Uh, I just wasn't clear from the sketch. Is the, is the purpose of the variance to allow a garage to be built? No, a sunroom. A sunroom. Yeah. It's on, the, it's on the south side and uh, will face the lake. Okay, any further questions? All those in favor of the motion. And that's carried. We'll move into committee. Uh, Councillor Buds, Finance, Legislative and Property Committee, please. Thank you. Uh, the first item up on uh, my agenda will be the tax levy bylaw, the second and third readings, but uh, that requires a public hearing, which was advertised to take place at 7 o'clock. So I will delay that and cover it under new business, and we'll do that at 7 o'clock. Other than that, I've got the first quarter reports, which were presented to committee um, at our last council meeting, and so that concludes my report here tonight. City Planning and Economic Development, Councillor Buds, again, please. So there's two items that were dealt with in hearings. Um, the third one is the building reports, again, that were reviewed in, by uh, committee. Um, first quarter report was uh, presented by PRED, and there were some comments in there from me stating that we just wanted to change up that report from uh, um, what it currently is comprised of and maybe expand on it a little bit, which to which I think Douglas uh, commented that he would do that for our next report. So, um, barring any questions in that portfolio, uh, that concludes that report as well. Thank you, Councillor Buds. Uh, Community Services Committee, um, Councillor Fraze, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the only items we have are the first quarter reports that were reviewed last uh, council meeting. Uh, those reports were from Parks, PCRC, and uh, the Youth Councillor Donovan Hillman uh, presented his report last council meeting. Unless there's any questions on those reports, that would be all I have tonight. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fraze. Uh, Waterworks Committee, Councillor Wall, please. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, <coughs> committee reviewed the uh, first quarter reports from the Waterworks Committee, the Water Pollution Control Facility, and the Water Treatment Plant, and the annual report from the Water Pollution Control Facility, and those will be available on the website <coughs> shortly. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Uh, Transportation Committee, Councillor Dracoff, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, last time we met, the Transportation Committee reviewed the engineering report for the first quarter as well as the transportation report for the first quarter. And again, unless there's any questions, then that concludes my report. Thank you. Public Safety Committee uh, this evening, Councillor Fraze, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Last uh, council meeting, we had uh, some discussion both from uh, Fire Chief Carpenter and from Inspector Head from the RCMP, and uh, we reviewed those reports, and they're available again. Uh, just maybe want to make a quick comment about how fortunate we are that we're not facing the public safety risk that a city uh, such as Fort McMurray is currently facing, and, and we know that it's uh, currently hot and dry and fire season all over the country, so unless somebody has something to add about that, um, that would be all I have to me. I did have a question, Councillor Fraze, for you or, or for Chief Carpenter. Um, now, the department's been very busy the last while, both in the city of Portage Prairie and the RM. There's a provincial fire ban right now, but they're still burning on going on in the RM. Why, why is that? Uh, it's my understanding that the RM does not have a blanket burning ban. But to speak to the details on that, I would defer to Chief Carpenter. Basically, the uh, provincial uh, fire ban is in relationship to any land that's owned by the province, be it Crown land or the provincial parks. They have a, a burning ban on that in the province of Manitoba. Beyond that, each municipality is responsible <coughs> to uh, implement their own fire ban, and they have to have a fire bylaw in order to implement that. At the present time, the RM of uh, Portage does not have that in place. It is their uh, wish, desire that they, they do not want to do that. So that's uh, where that sits at now. Um, we have to put that in mind. That's uh, the, the decision that they've made. 
the conditions are very dry out there right now and uh, we definitely do not recommend anybody to burn. If they do, they have to use some better judgment in, in doing so. I mean, accidents do happen. That's why we are there to help them when uh, these fires do occur. But please, uh, you know, keep that in mind and respect that because conditions are very dry presently. So, um, okay, so the RM does not have a burning ban in place right now. Yeah, that's correct. They, again, they don't, uh, there's a process where you have to have a fire bylaw in place, which in turn uh, a fire ban can then can then be implemented, and uh, that is not uh, not in place at this present time. So, um, not to put you on the spot, but in your professional opinion, um, would would safety benefit from this uh, burning bylaw if it was brought in for the RM? It is something that uh, I truly feel that it would benefit uh, the, the fact where um, sometimes we all need a little guidance, we'll say, in reference to uh, helping them in the decision making of, of not burning. So then if a ban is in place, then it just gives them some better direction not to do so. And if they do so, then, then uh, you can implement fines. and. Anytime a person does decide to burn, they can definitely be held liable as far as if the fire gets out of control, goes to neighbors and heaven forbid if it burns down some property of theirs. So these are all the things that you need to consider. And again, uh, most municipalities that I'm aware of in the province of Manitoba have one, but uh, again, that's the arm of Portage uh, decision and that's all I can speak to that. Okay, thank you, Chief Carpenter. Are there any further questions for Councillor Fraze? We have uh, no deferred business. Uh, we do have new business. Um, the first item is Crescent Lake Water Quality Improvement Study Award, uh, Community Services. Thank you. Uh, this is an issue that's been some time coming. Uh, several years ago, we had uh, a lot of questions and discussion around the quality of water in Crescent Lake, and more recently, there's been you know, a fair amount of action on the file as to what uses of Crescent Lake would be permitted. <clears throat> and so currently, we have uh, some results from the issuance of a request for proposals on water quality improvement study in Crescent Lake. And we have received a couple of responses to that request. Uh, we issued a request for proposals for consulting services for the development of strategies to improve Crescent Lake water quality. Uh, the scope of the work includes conducting background water, vegetation, and sediment assessment, assessing the needs for the use of the lake, and determining possible options for water quality improvement, and then developing specific strategies for the reduction of nutrients, algae, undesirable aquatic vegetation, and parasites, and identifying maintenance requirements, developing a public education and consultation plan, and preparing some cost estimates for possible future remediation work. Uh, the goal of the project is to have a long-term strategy to improve water quality in Crescent Lake. This will eventually allow increased recreational use, use and reduce the use of chemical weed control. Uh, could also reduce odors and improve the aesthetics of the lake. Three copies of this request for proposals were issued. Uh, Native Plant Solutions, a subsidiary of Ducks Unlimited, and North-South Consultants, in partnership with KGS Engineering, submitted proposals which were evaluated according to policy ENG slash F. The proposal from North-South Consultants demonstrated a very good understanding of the objectives of the project. Most of the tasks identified were clearly explained and include a comprehensive background water quality, vegetation, and sediment assessment on three dates through the open water season at three locations on the lake and one from the river. 
One item which was not clearly and fully addressed was the assessment of the contribution of flows and contaminants from the land drainage system. North-South has some experience working with the City of Portage of Prairie when they conducted water quality monitoring on the Assiniboine River. The second proposal from Native Plant Solutions demonstrated a very good understanding of the project and includes a very qualified project team. Most of the items noted in the requested scope were identified and discussed in relatively good detail. However, the proposed field work to assess the current state of the lake was not as comprehensively explained. Following the technical proposal evaluation, however, the time allotted for the field work is similar in both fee proposals, but Native Plant Solutions budgeted fewer funds for water and sediment testing than North-South. They did, however, propose to donate more time to developing options and significantly more time developing the project. And there's kind of a, a chart which rates the proposals on several different categories. And uh, in the final column lists the cost of each uh, company's proposal. And you'll see that North-South Consultants is the lowest bid. The city budget for this project, which was budgeted several years ago, was $34,000, and the low proposal is $14,626 over budget. There are no obvious components of the scope of work to cut from the proposed project, and no provincial funding has been budgeted, and it is unknown if there is a relevant funding program. Funding might be available from the Green Municipal Fund or community places. For the time being, administration proposes that the additional funding required be taken from the Community Development Plan budget as we anticipate a surplus in this budget line item. The draft report is due by September 26, 2016. And with that information as background, it is the recommendation of the Community Services Committee that a contract for consulting services for the development of strategies to improve Crescent Lake water quality be awarded to North South Consultants Limited for the proposed fee of $41,236 plus $7,391 in disbursements, excluding taxes, and that the funding beyond the budget be allocated from the Community Development Plan budget. And I so move. Moved by Councillor Freese, seconded by <coughs> Councillor Wall. Uh, any questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Buds. I have a question and a comment. I guess my comment firstly would be just to um, assure Council that there is enough funds within the uh, appropriate uh, request from the community development. That is not a concern that the funding will fall, fall short in that, that area. Um, we, we, we're actually running a little bit under budget in that department, so um, there's no fear that you know taking from that uh, will deplenish anything. Uh, the, the other part, though, that I just wanted maybe some clarification on, um, the point was that there was not um, real good explanation in terms of the impact on the lake as it relates to our land drainage system. And then from um, this company getting awarded a proposal, uh, it, it does, our, does our team feel that that is a significant shortfall in what we'd be paying for in terms of the effect that it could have on Crescent Lake if it's not being addressed in the report adequately? I passed that on to Kelly. Yeah, I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> well, that uh, that's not a significant portion of the the study, but it is uh, uh, it's something that we want to address. Uh, I did discuss it with uh, North South Consultants. Uh, they will address it in their uh, report. So you feel confident that what we get in the report that'll address that? Yes, I feel confident that they'll address it. That's all I have then. Just to be clear, Councillor Buds, the land drainage uh, inflow into the lake is what's collected off the streets in terms of storm drains and so on. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. Okay, any further questions on the motion? Comments? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. <coughs> Concludes our new business. We have no old business. As um, Councillor Buds mentioned, we do have a hearing. It's been advertised for 7 p.m., so we are going to keep at 7 p.m. There's people that are coming out for that. Um, 
specifically. Uh, so we are going to adjourn council and move into committee. And we are adjourned at 6.20 p.m. We'll move right into committee. And committee, just for people that haven't been here before, it is open to the public. It's open to the media. And uh, I invite you to stay for it. Okay, Councillor Buds, Finance, Legislative, and Property Committee. Thank you. A couple items in committee uh, for us to uh, to talk about is number one is the award for our janitorial janitorial services. Hard to believe that this tender is already up. Um, it's gone out, and there's three, three companies that have submitted um, information and a price to uh, for us to consider. Uh, one of them is our current janitorial service provider, and so uh, administration has gone through and, and in this report has indicated kind of the pros and cons of all of them in a similar fashion as they've always done. There has been, honestly, um, some concerns with our current provider in terms of the uh, ramp up of services when they first got on the contract and their inability to provide the necessary requirements at the uh, RCMP office in terms of public, uh, the public safety building for clearances. Um, there also has been on somewhat of a regular occurrence issues with the cleanliness and the job that's being performed with notes being left for reminders for, for uh, areas that needed some additional attention. So I, I will be bringing forth at our next meeting that the actual uh, award be um, given to Mighty Mop Janitorial, and that ends up being the lowest price. And we do have uh, the, the, the comprehensive, or there's been a comprehensive assessment done of this and actually some references, which um, is assuring that we're not, you know, sometimes you get what you pay for, and this is the lowest bid, but we take this bid knowing that there has been um, other people that we have reached out to and the, the positive responses in that regard. Um, is there any questions on that particular item? Yes. Hey, just had a question. Uh, reading through the report, it stated that our, at first we had some issues with our current contractor, and then those issues tended to go away when they had a local person with the specific security clearance that they require. Um, would our, if we go ahead with Mighty Mount Janitorial for their bid, would they be employing a local person as well? Or? That I don't think was in the bid. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, nor is it a requirement of the bid. Yeah. Of course, just being a concern from the last contractor that it was not a local person, and once a local person came on, then part of that was remedied. That just came as a point for me. But is there anything in there, Jam, that you wanted to contact or comment on? <laughs> the only thing I could say is it's difficult to dictate the uh, contractor who they employ. Mm -hmm. uh, we know from the RCMP's perspective that it takes a few months to get the secure, security clearances uh, in order. Uh, one would hope that they'd potentially approach the person that's doing it now and and uh, use their security clearance because it's valid, but can't control that. Okay, thank you. We have been talking about potentially next time splitting the contract, have one for the RCMP because their, their requirements are so different than the rest of the city buildings. Okay. That'll be for next time. Thanks. Uh, the other item was a collaborium agreement. Uh, that is with Gwyn and Simpson, and this is uh, more clerical than anything. Um, just some history. In 2006, the city of Port Jopur entered into an agreement with Gwyn and Simpson to build one columbarium, and that is for 48 niches. And that's just for cremated remains. This unit was installed and uh, has been filled up. So in 2013, Mr. Clark Gwynn approached uh, our cemetery foreman and indicated he was ready to implement the next phase. Um, but unfortunately, this did not get to administration at the time. And I think there, that was where the breakdown <coughs> in communication occurred. And there was another columbarium uh, built on site, which did not capture that particular unit, did not, was not captured in our initial agreement. So when they came again in this year, um, when Simpson approached the city seeking permission to add another one, that is when um, more information came to light. So negotiations uh, ensued at that point in time, and so we wanted to make sure through, through this amendment that all three of them were captured. So the proposed amendment recognizes the additional columbarium in the terms from the original agreement, and obviously moving forward, any new proposed columbarium will be negotiated with suppliers and installed in a designated area at the cemetery. 
So the agreement is attached there, and it is the standard agreement, obviously, with the updates as mentioned. So I'll be bringing that forth. Was there anything, any comments or questions on that? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Budge. Support, yeah. And uh, City Plan and Economic Development. And Councillor Budge, again, please. So there'll be one uh, variation request, and that's for the Fletcher at 700 Tupper Street North. Um, it uh, is there for your perusal. I do believe in this situation, the residents unfortunately had their garage burn, and uh, now uh, they want to replace that structure, although they want it to make it a little bit larger. So they are requesting some uh, variances there with regards to uh, encroachment spaces, et cetera. So I'll be uh, recommending approval, or I guess Councillor Drieger will be recommending that we approve that variation. And barring any questions on that particular item, that would conclude Councillor Drieger's committee report. Okay, um, just one comment for you as okay. the uh, chair tonight of Peck Development. Sure. I had the opportunity to attend the annual general meeting of the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce hosted by the Portage Chamber of Commerce Friday night at Southport. And um, the local chamber did a very good job. They brought a lot of people in, uh, put on a great event. I understand the rest of the weekend went quite well too. So um, your chair is the liaison with the chamber. So if you could pass those. Absolutely, I think it's important to recognize, thank you for bringing that up, and uh, the Manitoba Chamber um, also recognized that uh, the Portage and District Chamber of Commerce is one of the oldest Chamber of Commerce uh, recognized in the province, so there's a lot of history there. I was remiss actually also in just making sure that we uh, did provide uh, Douglas uh, from PRED any, uh, if there is any additional information that you would like to share with Council during their committee meeting as it relates to economic development, now's your time if you had anything to bring up. <laughs> In regards to the chamber function, or in general, uh, just just a small number. Douglas, could I just ask you to use the mic? Oh, um, sure. Actually, I can I can add one small note. Because our local chamber is actually one of the oldest chambers in the country. Not something that should be taken lightly. In regards to the chamber, that would be my comment. All right, then that does conclude my report. Okay, thank you both. <laughs> Community Services Committee, uh, Councillor Fraze, please. Thank you, Worship. Uh, a couple of items. First one relates to a cherished tradition, July 1st celebrations, and we're looking to do the standard road closures for the purpose of fireworks and uh, other activities on uh, in Island Park related to Canada Day celebrations. I'll bring that forward next meeting. Uh, the second item is sort of fast becoming a tradition as well. We're, we're getting a request from Harvest Call First Nations to do a gospel tent meeting on the grounds of North Memorial School. And it's a, uh, an event that's been taking place for a number of years. Uh, there have been in the past some concerns about the event running late into the night with loud music. And uh, that has... We've made a couple of different uh, adjustments, if I can put it that way, to the agreement to bring that back to 11 o'clock at night for the past year. And this year, they're asking to have one night at, uh, at midnight, I believe, uh, Saturday night at midnight. <clears throat> and if there's any questions about that. Um, but the recommendation that will be brought forward will be 11 o'clock and time every night? I believe that's what it says. Is that? 11 o'clock, yeah. So I think that the, this isn't new to us, and I think we've approved it every year. Is there any concerns from the addressing the noise issue other than what we have here? Uh, no, and having talked to people in the neighborhood, they're uh, quite pleased that the uh, festivities ended at 11 o'clock instead of 12 o'clock, and that seems to have uh, satisfied them. Okay. Can I comment on this? No, but we do have a question period. Um, this won't be decided tonight. This is just, uh, this will be coming up in the next council meeting. As soon as we're finished in committee, we're going to have question period, and you're welcome to ask questions okay. from the floor. Thank you. Any further questions for Councillor Fraze from council? I do have another item to, okay. to bring forward. Uh, the other item to bring forward is that we need to establish or would like to establish some mosquito control policy. 
Uh, currently, what we're doing is responding to provincial requests to fog for mosquitoes with malathion when there's any indication of a high mosquito count or risk of West Nile disease. Uh, our main mosquito control activity is larviciding. And what we're looking to do is establish a policy, a list of guidelines that tells us or informs us on what type of chemicals are best to use, uh, establishes more specifically the protocol as to when we respond to complaints and how we do the mosquito counts. And uh, there's quite a, a lengthy report on what that policy could look like, and we'll bring that forward for uh, discussion and approval next time. Any questions for Councillor Fraze on that item? Councillor Bunt. <laughs> Sorry. I was just wondering, I think it's a good idea for us to get a policy that uh, that is a little bit, provides parameters that everyone can uh, understand. I guess when I read the report, it talked a lot about uh, landing times. So. Uh, if one person is available, is, you know, that person will count the number of mosquitoes landing on the front of their body over a 10 minute period. And then that'll determine whether or not there's fog. And so my question would be, is that a common practice in other cities on how that is handled? And, um, and if so, is that a successful way to do it? So where did this come up from in terms of how that's how we decide on the foggy portion? I'm not familiar with the details of that. I know we use the mosquito trap kind of count. Mr. Braden? Yeah, I Yeah, the uh, mosquito landing uh, count procedure is uh, actually a procedure developed by the province, and uh, that's what we follow. I can't really speak for other municipalities, but uh, presumably they would be doing the same thing. Other, other municipalities I know uh, have uh, mosquito traps and they count mosquitoes. Uh, our mosquito traps are managed by the province and they're more interested in looking at uh, the Culex tarsalis uh, mosquitoes for, uh, for the West Nile virus. So in your expert opinion, um, do you think that a result of this policy and putting in the 10 minute landing period, would we see more fogging, the same amount of fogging or potentially less fogging as we've seen in the past in our city? And I, yeah. In my expert opinion? That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't, I can't answer that. I'm not sure uh, how that's gonna sh <coughs> shake out. Because I'd hate to see us by putting this policy in place actually put in a policy that has less fogging because um, I know that there are proponents that say that they do not like fogging in our city and it does not work as much as larvicide and I think that science may dictate that but there is no question that residents, uh, myself included, feel that when we fog for mosquitoes they are far less of a nuisance than they are before we fog. So I would not want to have this policy put in place if we're going to fog less than we currently have. But, uh, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, but that method of assessing the uh, the landings is not new. I mean, that's how we've been doing it for several years. It's just that now we've put it to paper. Yeah, it's uh, we haven't been following the procedure exactly as established by the province. Uh, we've been doing like a bare arm count and that is not, that's not a safe, uh, necessarily a safe way of doing uh, mosquito counts especially when we're dealing with West Nile virus, you don't want to expose yourself to mosquitoes, right? As much as possible, so without, without uh, protection of some sort. So, so this is uh, fully clothed, uh, dark suit, and uh, ideally there's two people doing the counts. <laughs> I, I, think <it's laughs> I think it's also fair to make sure the public understands that if they are opposed to fogging, uh, they can make the request that their property be skipped. That's part of the policy as well. And I hate to kick a dead mosquito, but um, did we, were we not, we weren't fogging um, proactively as a city in the past very regularly. It was more so to deal with provincially mandated high West Nile virus mosquito counts, correct? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, we did the occasional nuisance mosquito fogging uh, based basically on, um, 
I guess the assessment of park staff mostly. So if, if they were exposed to a lot of mosquito bites, uh, then it was determined that, you know, we have an issue and fogging would take place. Uh, yeah, and then the province has mandated uh, on occasion uh, fogging for West Nile virus or Culex, Culex tarsalis mosquito control. I'm almost afraid to ask, but are there any further questions, no, Councillor Buds? <laughs> I just know that the last time we fogged, we were very short of malathion, so I was just wondering if we have much or in stock for 2016 for all the fogging that we're going to do. I have no further questions as it relates to mosquitoes. Okay, well, I have one point of clarification. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this um, control, mosquito control policy will not supersede the provincial, and there are no exceptions to spraying when the province orders spraying for West Nile. Is that correct? Is that still the way it is? Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. And that would conclude my report. Thank you, Councillor Fraz. Uh, Waterworks Committee, Councillor Wall, please. Waterworks Committee has nothing this evening, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, Transportation Committee, Councillor Draycott. Thank you, Your Worship. Transportation Committee has nothing to report this evening. Thank you. And Public Safety Committee, tonight, Councillor Fraz for Councillor Espy. Thank you, Worship. The Public Safety Committee has nothing to report tonight. Okay, thank you. So that concludes committee. Other than this is the first time I believe we've done question period at this time frame. So uh, question period, uh, members in the gallery of the public can step forward and ask a question. It doesn't have to be related to um, items on this evening's agenda. And I know, uh, Chris, I believe you had a question? Yes. Do I have to go up there? Or? No, it's, oh, it's up to you. I'm sure you can hear me. Okay. It's regarding the harvest gospel meetings, you're calling them? We're requesting you. I wrote a letter last year. Oh, regarding. sorry, Chris. I'm told we do want you to come up so that it can be recorded. Sorry. Oh. Close? Good? Good. Okay, my name is Chris Gibson. I live on Goodale Drive. Last year, I wrote a letter regarding we didn't know what was going on at North Moral School other than the noise level was atrocious. From 8 p.m. to 11 p.m., my windows were bouncing. And then you wrote me a letter on September 8, 2015, telling me what was going on, and you called it a gospel tent meetings. Meetings, I should be able to talk and you hear me. I don't think this is the right name for it, but why is it on school property when we have the fairgrounds, we have Republic Park, maybe that corner new thing over there for community to access. It's in the darkest corner. And they turn that amplifier on louder and louder as the hour goes on. So I don't think windows need to be bouncing and it doesn't need to be that loud. And it shouldn't be on, sorry, on school grounds. We have other facilities that this can happen at. So. My question is, why is it on the school grounds and you're letting the noise level go that loud? I know we have a noise bylaw, but... Okay, so I'll try to answer that question and, and certainly you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they would have asked the school board for permission. Okay. I believe it was, uh, they felt a fair bit of... It's PRA. Or, it's PRA. PRA property? Okay. And part of it was, I believe they felt quite a few of their congregation were in that area. Um, we did take note of your letter, Chris, and we've taken some steps, including an earlier time to wind it down, and the no we took note of the noise, and we're hoping these changes uh, make for a more productive event this summer, and, and less taxing on the neighborhood. Okay. But so I fully expect going to, to 11, and it's going to be loud? Because I just heard, what, they want a day for midnight now? Yeah, that's been turned down. That was the request. Okay. That's been turned down. It'll be 11 o'clock. And if the noise is bouncing your windows, what do we do? Because um, you'll approve this. The RCMP. Call the RCMP. And we'll make control. Okay, because I find that's one dark corner over there. Okay, I got your number. It's on speed dial. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions from the gallery? 
Keating. Mr. Knott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's the last I'm hearing Councillor Bud's flogging the fogging, but that's good because I don't like mosquitoes either. <laughs> um, I have four questions um, and I'll take my turn. The first question is to the Youth Councillor, Donovan Hillman, uh, Councillor Hillman, and um, when does your term finish and have you recruited someone to replace you? Well, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Knott. Um, the, I can address the first question. When my term concludes uh, at the last meeting of August, so we only have one meeting in August, and uh, I believe it's August 9th, 10th, something like that, where my term would conclude. Um, as to finding my replacement, uh, I believe that would be Council's decision, and I believe the process will begin in September. Uh, just further to that, the process will begin in September uh, through both high schools. Uh, this will be, um, the word will be put out to both West Park and the Portage Collegiate Institute. And uh, I, I think um, Councillor Hillman probably has, he certainly raised the bar in terms of interest and I think there are a number of younger students that have noticed um, some of those activities and there should be a fair bit of interest we anticipate in, in September. Next question. Forty questions. Okay, Mr. Baxwell will. Mr. Mayor, councillors, fellow citizens. I came to tonight because I misread the iPad today. I thought we were going to discuss boats on the lake. I thought that was going to be the discussion tonight. But I sit here and listen. We're doing $47,000 to test the lake water. Why? Because we're told we don't own it. The government owns it. So why do we spend any money on it? I mean, the easy way to test the water is send a test to Winnipeg for five bucks. They'll tell you whether it's contaminated or not, how bad it is. But uh, I just, have, I, I could say 40 questions. I've never heard anybody tell me what it's gonna cost to build a ramp, the new dock, the parking spots for the boats and the cars, all these things that take place putting boats in the lake. How much money is it gonna cost the taxpayers? Does anybody have those numbers? No, we don't. Okay. We have less than 75 people attend a meeting for improvements to Saskatchewan Avenue. They picked the plan. You made the statement in the paper. The citizens picked the plan. We go to the uh, Island Park PCU building. We have another committee meeting, and we picked the plan for less than 100 people for the new bridge. 602 people said no to boats in the lake. How many more do you need? Why don't we end it? Why are we carrying it on? Well, Why are we holding meetings and paying overtime to four people? Two volunteers and four people are getting paid overtime to go to these meetings. And I'm sure these two gentlemen would much easier to spend their time with their families. So why are we doing it? When's the end come? Uh, the end will come after September the 15th. Um, we will make submissions to the federal government. Uh, we will determine whether we're asking for restrictions. Um, we don't have jurisdiction. I think it's been out there in the media. Uh, the federal government has the ability to put restrictions on the use of that lake or not. Uh, we will be making those requests and, and we don't have a date. The deadline for submitting those requests is September 15th. We don't have a time frame for when they respond to us. If you follow the federal government, they'll tell you they have control over running water, great lakes and rivers. We've got a man-made pond. If we, it's stagnant water. If we don't pump water across it from the Cinnabon River, it's nothing. So tell me how the government has control of it. And right now, you're going to be uh, 10 years from now because right now the federal government is trying to dump responsibility on each province. I want to go in the paper that big article on it. The provinces don't want it, but the federal government wants to get rid of the responsibility. So why are we talking? This is not a lake. We keep referring to our lake. It's not a lake. It's a man-made pond. So why do we keep thinking the government has control? Well, that's because that's what we've been told. Um, we when I phoned them, they told me they only controlled moving water. If you look the lake, lake up in the dictionary, it tells you it's spring-fed water. It's not spring-fed. Well, if you, if you can give us the name of anybody that will say they don't have control, that we have control, we'd be happy to, to talk to them. We really would. In the meantime, we just keep spending money, $47,000 today. For what? How many checks? 
read in City Hall, how many times has this lake been tested and checked, and how many engineers and how many people have made reports on it? Go back and look. Seems every council wants to get something on the lake. I'm cheap, $47,000, a lot of money. We can fix some streets. So that's all. But I did have 40 other questions. Okay, well, we're. No, the, the, the lady didn't open the file for me. One of the iPad has said she's going to be here tonight. We're going to talk to the lake, but it didn't happen. So okay. I'll keep my questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the gallery? I have a question about the uh, Crescent man made pond, but I'll, I'll leave that in advance for a moment. Um, a question for the uh, chairman of the finance committee who in today's uh, budget or uh, financial plan presentation said that, as I read it, that there will be no increases on taxes because of debt for the next 10 years. On what basis do you predict that prognostication? I think what the quote uh, indicates is that through our 10-year capital plan, it doesn't allow for tax increases. That is the, that's a comment and that's a, that's the way we've been doing our capital planning for the last, well, since I've been in this post. So we don't, when we build the capital plan, we don't build automatic tax increases into that plan to fund it. That's the, that's the quotation. Now, I've also been uh, indicated as saying, and I know I have, that we may have to incur debt, and we will, through uh, infrastructure expenditures as relates to water treatment. And to say that we wouldn't entertain tax increases through that process, I think, is naive. And uh, I think that it is something that our community would face if we had a significant amount of debt, debt issuance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chairman of the committee. Um, it's just that the on the reading I did, it was bolded, and, and I thought, oh, well, there's a statement. Uh, the second question is also on the budget uh, finance and <laughs> forecast. And that is that the, I didn't see, I haven't read the financial plan yet. Is there a, a feature built in for the new bridge? Uh, and in that case, what is the prognosis for the engineering study for the bridge? What's happening? When will we get it? I've just seen no activity there for anyone making studies or checking out the uh, underground or whatever. What's happening? Maybe that's a better question to the councillor responsible for transportation. Currently, we are going through the process. We are waiting for our report to come back as to our final functionality report for the bridge. Uh, previously, we had asked for uh, what the possibilities were, and now we are asking for amounts of money to proceed with the bridge land. So we are currently waiting for that report to come back to us, and we are hopeful that it will be back to us shortly. I can Thank also you, Council, through the Mayor. Mr. Mayor, um, I didn't know what a functionality report is. Oh, well, I apologize, Mr. Mott. Not. We are currently waiting for the report to come back to tell us dollar amounts to build a bridge. There was the first part of the question had to do with finance, the bridge and the debt management plan, is that correct? Yes, there, there is an allotment and it continues to be an allotment going forward for the bridge. Um, when, when we go through this process, uh, we, you, as you know, in living across from the bridge, Mr. Knott, that there has been activity on there and soil sampling, et cetera. So we're still, as Councillor Draycott had mentioned, we're still awaiting the report, which will come through administration and then to council in terms of next steps. But rest assured um, that the, the bridge is still uh, front and center in this council's planning and, uh, and you will see that as we move forward. Um, further questions from the gallery? Last quick question, Mr. Mayor, um, and uh, it's a comment really more. Thank you for the question period where anyone can ask a question. It's not a time for statements, it's a time for questions. So how have you felt about this first question period? Well, I, I you know what, I, I feel very good about it for a couple reasons. Uh, and I feel very good about uh, the folks that come out and ask questions. I know uh, Mr. Knott had raised the issue about why do we need uh, something. We'd taken a page from Brandon's about what happens if somebody comes out and they're profane or whatever. And, and uh, usually the people of Portage aren't that way. So um, that's a good point. Um, 
There will also be a chance for questions when we go into um, uh, the capital plan, uh, when Mr. Buds has a chance to present it at 7 o'clock, there's a chance for people to, uh, the public to make comments on it or ask questions about it. So. Um, we do appreciate seeing people come out. I know it's a nice evening and um, sometimes there's not many people come to council. This evening there's a few more and that's very nice to see. Um, I should give a plug right now. The next council meeting we have will be on Tuesday, uh, May the 24th, right after Victoria Day. And that one will be held at the PCU Centre. So you may even get a cup of coffee out of it if you come out to it. And um, we would, uh, I know it's nice weather, but if you get a chance, come on out on that Tuesday evening. <laughs> what? Sorry, and a donut. We'll we'll see what the budget says. We have got to check with finance. We completely accept donuts, Mr. Knox. <laughs> Were there any other questions from the gallery? Okay. Well, we are going to adjourn committee, and we're going to uh, take a break. And at seven o'clock, we're going over the capital plan right here. I invite all of you to stay for it. We are adjourned at six. 50 computer time. Thank you. Right. Uh, but it, it does work out to on an average of uh, $100,000 assessed, sorry, assessed at $100,000, um, $16.23 is approximately the increase. And you can see the comparison to, uh, there. So wait, the next slide, um, you, you have heard me, <coughs> excuse me, talk a lot about where our mill rate is. Um, and what we've done in the past, and um, I know that uh, media has picked up on, and we were ranked in the top three um, in the past in terms of our mill rate, but I think this is a positive trend lined in this graph. It shows that uh, our mill rate is dropping. Um, so the only way that we're making headway in, uh, in our efforts to be competitive in the province is if our reduction in our mill rate is more than um, comparable municipalities, which we do, not, we do not have that data as of yet, but we will be bringing that forth over time. But uh, from my perspective when, and from, um, I guess, from an economic development standpoint, when, when investors are looking at Portia Prairie as a destination, we have to have the amenities, but we have to be competitive. And so um, when we are in top three, in a peer group, which honestly is not even that geographically, um, you know, uh, not close to us, it is. Uh, it's something that is noticed if our mill rate is is higher. We also get asked what percentage of our tax bill that's paid is um, municipal and what is school division. So approximately 61 percent of the taxes that are collected is uh, for municipal use, and 39 percent is for the school division. So this graph, next one, a linear graph, property value assessment and tax collected and mill rate, kind of giving an idea of the blue line. Um, your assessment has been going up if you're a resident in Portage, and you've also heard me say I think that's a good thing um, because I know it, it, it is something that um, draws the eye of a lot of citizens if their assessment rises a lot, but that means that there is some positive movement going on in your city, that things are growing, there's investment being made, and it is a good thing if you are growing as a city. Um, the one thing that you don't want to see parallel growth on if you're a citizen is the mill rate going up um, at the same pace as what your assessment is. And you can see in this linear graph too that you do see a reduction in the mill rate as assessment has been climbing. So we are managing that, I would say, as a council. So what happens to reserves when you start uh, spending money to operate the city? Um, this is, uh, again, the green is utility. The um, light blue is fuel tax and the dark blue is our general reserves. And you can see that there has been, you know, gaps that have been created throughout the years in these reserves. Um, primarily the utility, you see it growing and I think we all know why the utility reserve is growing. Uh, we do have to set aside funds for our for utility, or sorry, for nutrient removal project. Um, you can see the ending 2016 balance nutrient removal will be an operating surplus of about 11.6 million and we're, we are within all uh, legislative requirements here in terms of reserve balances. So um, on a positive note on our debt, um, a comment was made tonight in terms of our debt level. In 2016, our city outstanding debt drops to $12 million or a little bit more than $12 million. Um, water and sewer rate averages increases 6% and that's previously approved 
through the utility board increases in our water and sewer rates, but you do see a significant amount of debt uh, that's taken on through the uh, following years, and again, that's related to uh, nutrient removal. This does take into account, though, that we're borrowing at a pace that would be higher than what we we want to, and we, as, as I've been quoted, and I st stand firm on this, if we do not get the level of support that's required from both the federal, federal and provincial governments, it's not uh, within the city's capability to borrow enough to complete the project as it stands right now. So really, it is almost a, it's a standstill project unless you've got levels of government coming to the table. So where does the city's revenue come from? And another graph kind of just shows where it comes from. Approximately 11, or the bulk of it really, is from um, utility rates uh, and taxes, so $21 million. We do get grants and we take money from reserves, but those are kind of your three main areas, your four main areas where the funding does come from. Um, and again, the utility, just as a reminder, the utility is uh, self-funding, so the utility rates uh, that are charged and the revenues that we collected funnel into utility expenditures. So it's not that we take from kind of general reserves or general taxation that goes into utility. Utility. So then where does the money that you collect get spent? Um, there it is. The general operating fund receives 43%, the utility operating fund of 27 and res reserve withdrawals of 26%. And then, yes, we're on the same slide. So from our general operating fund, where do those funds that we collect, so from the taxation dollars that we collect from citizens, where do those money get spent on average? And you can see that um, there is a significant uh, demand on our dollars, um, debenture payments, so that's debt payment, 27%, government services, 13 policing, 21%, uh, uh, transportation, 13 and uh, parks, rec, uh, 15 So. You can see that um, there is a, so just as a reminder, government services, that makes up fire protection, animal control, and parking meters. So those two, in terms of public safety and recreation, um, demand a lot of dollars out of the mon monies that we're collecting from, from citizens. And quite frankly, it's the, it's the services that they expect and uh, we should deliver. So, uh, but that is a breakdown of kind of where those funds uh, go. Then if we flip to the utility side of things, um, where do they go? It's water supply of 44%, investment of capital of 28%. This is, uh, but will go up, obviously, with the capital. We transfer about 23 or almost a quarter of the money that we collect into reserves. We make some debt payments. That will go up if the uh, project that we're talking about uh, is undertaken in the fashion that it is. And then uh, sewage collection and disposal, about 13%. So capital plan. This is what I've been stated in saying that this capital plan as it's constructed doesn't take into tax increases into, into consideration. So um, those are really light blue tabs on the, or sorry, very small tabs on the bottom, but um, economic development is the blue, uh, public safety is the green, and the blue is operations in terms of where that money would be spent. Um, and then the operations breakdown is, is on the right hand side at about $25 million. Um, with a significant investment in several areas um, in our city. So just to capture some of the items that are over $500,000 uh, over a 10-year period, uh, I think it's, um, it should be mentioned that we are proactive in our city and that we plan for 10 years. It's not a legislative requirement to do so. We do, it is five years only, and we proactively look at 10. Now, that's not to say that anything that we have um, you know, I glassed out for 10 years actually comes to fruition, but you do have to have a plan in terms of where the spending uh, is going to take place and probably more importantly where the money is going to come from to address the spending. So Island Park Bridge, uh, another $2 million. Uh, just as a reminder, in our 2016 capital plan, there's a significant investment in our bridge already, so that's why it doesn't show a larger amount. Whether or not all of those funds get spent in 2016, if you look across the lake right now, I would suggest that the capital plan spending allotted to the bridge in 2016 will not come to fruition uh, based on where we are in the time of the year and uh, the decisions that have not been yet made as of yet. So there will be a carry forward amount uh, into next uh, couple of years. Um, and again, some limestone path paving. Uh, we have to do some uh, renewal reserves for heavy equipment. Uh, we have a, a pumper for the fire department that's established and then you can see the rest of it. Another item um, that is moving up the 10-year plan is our Saskatchewan Avenue West project, and it is really addressing the infrastructure um, above and below um, road surface as it relates to everything beyond 8th Street, basically out to the co-op mall. 
Um, so that is something that this council has made, uh, um, you know, as a pressing issue in our, in our 10 year plan. So moving to a capital plan now, just to our utility side. Previously, that was our, our operating side. Um, there is um, a significant amount, and I won't go through all of it, but $132 million spent over the next 10 years on our utility. Uh, water treatment plant, reservoirs, $14 million. So that, um, you look at that, so water distribution, wastewater collection, $20 million right there. But if you look down, nutrient removal at city, uh, $93 million. So again, we have to do this and um, for this type of planning, but again, uh, this is not something that we could actually undertake on our own at that level of expenditures. We do it for planning purposes, but there would have to be an ejection from provincial and federal bodies. Um, and the granulated active carbon replacement is relates to our, our water treatment plant for another 7.4 million, and for that is, is almost like a big glorified Brita water filter for our drinking water out at the uh, water treatment plant. So very significant um, investment by our city and probably, not probably, it is historic in terms of the amount of money that is required from base infrastructure. And we, t we hear a lot about that uh, when we travel as councillors to uh, conventions in terms of uh, lobbying by AMM to different levels of government for infrastructure dollars. And as you can see in our city, we are not unlike everybody else in the amount of money that needs to be spent to maintain and expand the services uh, that we're currently using and prepare us for the future. And again, I won't go through each one of these, but those are some items over $500,000 in our utility capital plan. So as always, uh, we have it uh, available on our website. So we have our tax calculator in there. We have the detailed capital and new additional listings, our financial plan and our grant listings. So that, can kinda, that concludes the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I will leave the uh, public hearing open. If there's questions as it relates to that slide presentation or anything else, we can address those and then we will close and we will go into second and third reading. So questions from public regarding the capital plan? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the Chairman of the Finance Committee, a well presented quick <coughs> thing. Good. Uh, nice color. Will a piece of information in a written form be sent to all households in the city on this? When it is stated that things go up on the website, that's all very well. There's a lot of people who don't have computers, they don't work on computers, they don't care, whatever, but they do read the information that comes out once every six months or whatever it is from the city council. Would yeah. council consider putting out a publication doesn't have to be glossy, can be three or four pages on this kind of thing saying this is what's going to happen. Just to answer your question, um, we will and just have recently discussed um, council briefs. It's a, a familiar document that goes out into mailboxes of residents. Um, the financial or our, my committee does at this time of year a more comprehensive um, news message that captures exactly what we're talking about and that will be distributed to each household in a paper format. Will it be three to four pages long? Probably not, but it will be a summary of the document that we're talking about here tonight. That would be a yes. Thank you. Uh, second question on the same thing and that is that the circular that was the first slide says that the process is continuing and is ongoing. Nowhere in the process is there a specific way of asking people what they would like to see spent. The information given to council comes out in detail, very well presented, once the potential budget is fulfilled. But there doesn't seem to be a process of involving people first before the budget comes up into, into um, detail. Is there any indication by council that a different understanding of what a budget process might be is being considered? So I think in the planning cycle, Mr. Knott, it clearly identifies public consultation. And quite honestly uh, and candidly, Mr. Knott, you are pretty much the only individual that approaches council with that direct, uh, as a direct question like that. We are not, as council, inundated with additional requests for that. Not to say that um, that wouldn't, uh, that we wouldn't entertain that. 
Um, we have hosted budget consultation meetings before and, and honestly are poorly attended. Um, not because we haven't made an effort to make them well known. I know we've done a good job of trying to make that. So, you know what, we are um, trying to engage the public in this process. The fact is that there is different levels of willingness of uh, participation and we welcome any commentary that you may have as it relates to the budget process through our public consultations. But will we change beyond what we're currently doing? Um, quite likely not for this planning cycle. Um, other questions from the gallery? No other questions? Okay, Councillor Butts. Resolved at the public hearing for the 2016 tax levy bylaw 16-8645 uh, and the 2016 financial plan now be closed. Moved by Councillor Butts, seconded by Councillor Wall. Any comments or questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. So we've, as, as council, have gone through this uh, um, first time, uh, last meeting, and then we've gone through this presentation. I know you've read it. I am not going through uh, line per line in this report. I will highlight, though, as uh, Mr. Nod had mentioned, uh, just to highlight again, just so everybody's clear, the 10-year plan includes no increases in taxes for capital projects in any of the 10 years. Um, not to say that we wouldn't have to address it if we were taking some of this on, but when we build it, it does not include tax increases. So it is a recommendation of the Finance Committee and I so move that bylaw number 16-8645 being a bylaw of the City of Port Prairie to authorize a levying and raising of property taxes for school and municipal purposes for the year ending December 31st, 2016 be given second reading. Moved by Councillor Buds, seconded by Councillor Wall. Any comments or questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And that bylaw 16 8645 be given third and final reading, finally passed, signed, and sealed. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And we are adjourned at 7 20 p.m. Thank you.